What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the Quarantine Zone, and we got Ross the Boss on the phone. Great to talk to you, man. Hey, thanks, Alex. Yep, it's awesome to have you here. We got the new Death Dealer album coming out this November called Conquered Lands. You just want to talk about like how the making of this record was, like in terms of like the songwriting, the recording, all that fun stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, we've been, uh, as you know, uh, that's our third record, and uh, we've been, you know, since the since the the this nonsense with this. Uh, this, this virus, we had plenty of time to, uh, you know, make things happen. You know, plenty of downtime. So, but the, you know, we the, the plans for the plans for the third third record were were uh, before this before this happened. So, um, you know, we had a whole bunch of songs. Um, Stu and Sean, main songwriters of the band, um, uh, they had the songs and. Uh, so we decided to go forward with our third record, and because um, a lot of you know, because I tour and the band tours and other projects, so now we thought it would be perfect time for the third record. Um, we had the music, we had the material, and so uh, there you go. Yeah. So basically, like this whole shit with the world happening basically sped up what was uh, going to happen to begin with. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, it's, it's allowed it's allowed the band to to record so much music. We have. Uh, Death Dealer 4, and we have Death Dealer 5 recorded. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm recording solo. I'm recording my mu I'm, my stuff on, on Death Dealer 4 as we speak. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, uh, for, for, for the neg negativity of what's happened, you have to turn it into positivity. So that's what we've, we've done. Absolutely. I was saying that, you know, obviously, you know, everything sucks right now with no shows and stuff like that. But, you know, ice being isolated and all this negativity and all this unrest, I mean, it's going to be some great fuel for art. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the comeback in the, in the music industry is going to be great because there's so much pent up demand uh, for, for, for everything. It's just, it's just, it's, it's just really amazing. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I just, you know, I'm from, I live in New York. I live in Queens. And, you know, it's the, the theater industry and the music industry. And, uh, everything is just on pause and, and, and people are not making money. And, uh, you know, there's people, this is their livelihoods. And it's just really sad. But uh, I think at the, in the end, I think uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Definitely, definitely. This is metal. Nothing will take us down. Right. Now, being that this is the third Death Dealer album, do you guys kind of have like a formula or a sound that you try to stick with? Or is there kind of like experimentation that you try to incorporate in every album? You know, actually, what really is the, the, the guiding the guiding light of the band songs. You know, I think that uh, in any band that I'm in, it's, it's, it's all about the songs. You know, uh, I don't care who's in the band, and we have a mighty lineup. I don't care who's in the band, but this, the music and the song, the songs have to be uh, righteous. That's the most. That's what guides this band, and and my band. Yeah, so it's all, it's all about the songs. Yeah, and like, do you, would you say that you know, with your background in Man of War and all the projects you've been involved with, and you know, being that Death Dealer is like a super group in a way, maybe do you guys maybe like combined your previous experiences into one, or were, were you guys trying to maybe like step trying to step into like uncharted territory for all of you? No, I think what we do is we do what we do. You know, I uh, we do what we do, and we add, uh, we put, we come together as a band. Uh, I think the songs just uh, the songs represent that. Um, I I don't think there's any new uncharted territory in uh, in metal music. You know, I, I, honestly, I think but what but with the fr a fresh approach to it is what 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 is needed, and, and is, that's what we do. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, like, in the end, when you really look, I feel like your music always says so much anyway that, like, there's really no need to, like, you know, all of a sudden do what people aren't expecting. I feel like you have such a signature guitar sound and a signature sound with Death Dealer and all of your previous work that I think you always just have a lot more left to say. Yeah, you know, it's been amazing. Uh, it's, it's actually an honor to be able to play. Um my guitar has been able to fit into so many, I mean, multi, multi genres, 
uh, with the dictators and, um, you know, I've, I've touched on blues rock and country rock and all other stuff. And then just as well as, you know, the metal, you know, the Ross Boss Band is, is, back, is pretty hard. And then Death Dealer. So I have two metal bands and, and the Dictators are, are recording now. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's as long as I'm myself, it's, it seems to be working. Yeah, it do because like, do you tend to like depending on the project you're with? Is it like a different mind frame depending on the project you're working with, or is there kind of like a usual method behind the madness that applies to everything? Uh, I think what 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 it really is is whatever that whatever the song requires, that's what I do. You know, I think the the song requires a certain type of solo. Well, that's what the song gets. As I said, I harken back to what I told you before about the songs. Ruling, well, that's that's the name of the game. Songs rule. The songs come first. Whatever makes the song better, as guitar players, Stu Marshall and I, uh, we we get it. We we, we truly make sure it's there. Yeah, and, and you. What 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 I really like is that because sometimes when you're, I like how you focus on the song, like each and indi- individual song. Because sometimes when you're like thinking about the the entirety of the album, or you're thinking about another project, or you know this may apply to this, like you don't you don't seem to like get distracted when the song is there. When you're working on a song, that's all you focus on. You don't really let anything else distract you, right? Yes, exactly, um, uh, Alex. That's all that matters. It's, it's, it's the song and uh, you know uh, when, when people hear Stu and I playing together uh, it's just been since the first record it's just been well what I don't play he plays and what he doesn't play I play and we're glad to do that it, you know that's how we work together because I'm not I can't play like him and he can't play like me and uh, and no one can sing like Sean Hmm. And now we have our new bass player, uh, Mike LaPond, who's to me is one of the best bass players in the, in the world, on the planet right now. And uh, along with uh, Steve Bolognese, our, our drummer, uh, we have we have a great band. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's great to play with them. Yeah, I interviewed Mike LaPond uh, back in the beginning of this apocalypse. Super talented individual. Yes. Yes, and he's uh, as nice as he is talented, that's for sure. Absolutely. And a New Yorker as well, so you can't go wrong with well, that. Well, we'll give him that. He's from New Jersey. Oh, okay. Well. Okay, we just, we'll cut him a little credit. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, I call Jersey the... Where in Jersey? Because I consider like parts of Jersey to be like the sixth borough at this point. Yeah, right, right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> wow, you, you might have just ruined his reputation there. I love it. <laughs> That'll be the headline of this article. Breaking news. Michael Pond is actually from New Jersey. Right, right. <laughs> now, for your guitar soloing, do you have like a theoretical background? Like I'm working off of this scale and this mode? Or are you more on the self-taught side? And when you're writing the songs, you tend to like to maybe improvise a little bit? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm self-taught. And uh, I mean, I, whatever the, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm basically a blues guitar player growing up in the Bronx. And uh, that's what I am. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm who I am, you know. And uh, that's just, you know, it's I'm not. I don't. I don't approach a song like, let's see how many chords I can get in here, or well, let's see how many notes I could, you know, blast by. <laughs> no. Yeah. If, if the song, if the solo calls for eight notes, I play eight notes. If the solo calls for. Uh, a hundred notes, I play a hundred notes. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it, because I've always said that there's some guitar solos where I don't care if you're, you know, you're, you're shredding for like three and a half minutes straight. To me, right. the solo is meant to convey just as much emotion as like the vocals do and really kind of convey all that. And there's some really strong guitar solos that just have maybe three or four notes in it. Exactly. I mean, uh, growing up, my idols were B.B. Were, uh, King and Blues Guys, Freddie King and... Uh, Mike Bloomfield and uh, shows you how, how how old I've been in, how uh, long I've been in the business. But uh, Jimi Hendrix and you know guys like that, that that you know really know how to play. And you know less is less is more. Less is always more. Yeah, definitely. And again, it's all about the songs. So like, and you know, the songs, everything I've listened to you incorporate, whether it was with your stuff with Manowar or Death Dealer or Dictators or anything like that, like the, you focus on the song, not just the solo within the song. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that shows through that, that shows me that I've done, I'm doing what I'm really, um, you know, I'm supposed to be doing. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, there's something to be said, you know, like Eddie Van Halen, for example, you know, God rest his soul, but like, you know, you know, we could watch him shred all day long. He conveys emotion and imagery with everything he does. But, you know, sometimes you take a great solo and I'm not going to mention names, but like, you know, you're shredding all. I'm like, what do these guys get paid by the note or something like that? So. Yeah, but if you really analyze Ed, Ed's work, I mean, he's really a very melodic guitar player. I mean, he's 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 done. A, uh, he says a lot with a lot less. He's not as he's not as insane as you think he is. I mean, if you really if you really if you really isolate him, then, then uh, I mean, he's very tasteful. Yeah, well, he has like a classical influence as well, and you could kind of uh, like he, he actually has the same influences that I have, and he has the same influences that I have. Angus Young and Naomi. So. Yeah, it's very impressive work. And, um, you know, when it comes to, like, getting inspired to write, like, in order to, like, for that artistic inspiration to come through, do ideas sometimes just come out of the blue? Or do you sometimes need to, like, put yourself in a certain element or put yourself in a certain atmosphere in order to kind of, like, let the creativity flow through? Uh, no, I, you know, it, I, I wish I could turn it on. There's a spigot that I could turn on uh, inspiration and, and creativity, but there isn't in music. Um it's just it hit it, it hits you, you know, and then when it hits you, you got to be prepared to 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 go with it. Uh, music is it's, it's not a you can't turn it on. It's all oh, I'm going to go now. I'm now going to go right. You know, a lot of guys are like that. Well, I'm going to go and write. How could you do that? I don't know. Some people are like that, but I, it's not me. You know, I I can I have to. It just hits you. You know, yeah. it's like so, the songs they hit me and they just when I'm writing and it's like <laughs> it's like a gift <laughs> sure it's a gift it's a gift from the gods <laughs> all right yeah just, just I'd imagine inspiration sometimes strikes us at the most inconvenient times as well right yeah that's why you have phones and that's why you have mic uh, microphone hmm. <laughs> and voice record but <laughs> <laughs> how difficult was it more back in the day <laughs> it was harder back in the day because you had to remember it but when you're a lot younger you could remember it better you had better memory <laughs> Okay, fair enough. So, players with microphone in it. <laughs> yeah, so you you came into the world at like the perfect time when you when you were young, you were able to memorize everything, and now we're able now we have phones and everything like that. So it's never been exactly. easy to keep track of things. It's never been hard to keep track of things, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. We we, uh, we use the uh, we use our our technical advances. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with technology and music. No, absolutely. Not. Do you find it maybe easier, though, to come up with new ideas when maybe, like, you're in the company of your other bandmates? Or do you sometimes, you know, sometimes I've noticed, like, a lot of guitar players, you know, isolation and, you know, like, solitary confinement is often, like, a great fuel. Do you find it easier to come up with ideas when you're alone or when you're with your other bandmates? Sometimes, sometimes, Alex, but I, I think it's when, uh, I would say that uh, when we're together... And we're doing our thing together. We're doing our, you know, the death dealer thing together. I think the music flows. And once the music flows, like when we start playing new songs that we have never played live, because we, we can't because our, of our, our ge geographical constraints. You know, Stuart is in um, is in Sydney. Uh, Mike is in New Jersey. I'm in New York. And, and Sean and Sean and Steve are in Los Angeles. I mean, yeah, yeah we. You, we really can't just, oh, let's have a practice. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, uh, but when we come together to tour, that's when we're together, and that's when the, the spark starts flying, when we're in the same room together and we, and we hit the stage. Yeah. You guys... So we've, gotten you, lot, we've gotten a lot out of, of being together, and we're going to be doing that soon. So, hopefully. So, <laughs> you know, so... Yeah. You, you need a member from South America now, or from Europe. Yeah, or, of course. That's, yeah. Yes, that's it. Or, yeah. Or Far East. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make it make it ten times more complicated. But yeah, you'll course, you'll rule the world there, literally. There again, we were talking about the the technical advantages, the the fact that we're just uh, you just need when you're doing we're doing music, you just make files and send it, and the guy they have it, and like they have it in in like lightning, and then you know, like the other night, I'm working on a solo for, on Death Deal of Four, and I have Stu. Stu on the camera it's like he's in the room and like uh, me and my engineer were going How, how's this da, 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 how's this and then he goes well, well Ross why don't you try this and then so that's the, that's the beauty of it you know 
back uh, a little while ago, there was no way you could have done that. Yeah, it would be cool though. I know that some artists are probably getting so lonely right now that they're making cardboard cutouts of their bandmates and just like having their their uh, computer like behind behind them just to pretend they're practicing with them. Uh, it's, it's it's I don't know. It's it's, it's tough. It's, it's really tough. And plus plus our livelihoods have been taken away from us. And uh, but I'm I'm kind of I feel very lucky because I have my own business and uh, uh, I own a batting cage. In, in, in Middle Village, Queens, and we've had it for 16 years, and you know, we just, it's its a, its its something we do because we love the family and the baseball is a, and softball and cricket is such a great thing, and it's, uh, I'm really glad we have it because that's what's paying the bills right now. Yep. And so. And God will allow you to take out some aggression as well, right? Oh, yeah, whenever I win, whenever I feel a little, little cooped up, I take, I, I rip out my one of my bats and start, you know, I get, you know, I start ripping, so uh, it's it's a great thing, you know. And music and sports are, are always a, a cool thing. It's always been a they go they go hand in hand. Yeah, definitely. And you need to like because music and sports. Like I actually heard like because music and sports are so like entwined with each other that I heard that some athletes actually have to learn at some point how to dance because like there's like a rhythm element to like the yes. sports game and stuff as well. In the, in the NFL. Uh, these guys, these gigantic guys, study study uh, ballet, you know, and uh, it just gets their, you know, you would think that they would never do that. It just makes their approach, you know, their footwork. You know, it's all about footwork. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And, and think about like how many people like work out to certain music, like music and art or, and sports, like they're all like the same thing. They really let people express themselves and let people let out emotion and yeah. all that. So like people say, yeah. oh, I'm a sports guy. I'm an art guy. I'm, I'm like, it's all the same thing. Absolutely. And, Yep. Now, one question I have for you, this might be a little bit of a silly question, but I really have always wondered about this. Going as Ross the Boss, I mean, you know, I've seen you at, like, Duff's and St. Vitus before, and we've talked before, and, like, you know, I see people calling you Boss all the time and all that. So, like, going as Ross the Boss, you almost feel like that when you're on stage, you almost, like, portray, like, an external character outside of yourself in a way? Yeah, you know, that, but the people, people don't understand when they see me, they think it's a pompous if they don't know me, sometimes they think it's popping. Who is this guy? There's only one boss, and he's in New Jersey. But uh, <laughs> I've had that name forever. And the, the reason why it's, it's Ross the Boss is because uh, uh, with the Dictators, uh, with our first record in, in 1975, um, we were like, let's we will take like these Jewish kids, these snotty Jewish kids from the Bronx, <laughs> and uh, you know, like. Ross Friedman, uh, Richard Blum, Andy Chernoff, Scott Kemp. I mean, these are all Jewish names that, uh, you know, and we didn't think that that would go over. We didn't think that that would fly. So we said, guys, we got to take some, we got to take some nicknames, you know, because these, our Jewish name, our, you know, our Jewish American names are, you know, they're just not, they're not like exciting. I mean, we just, uh. So we decided to take the, take our nicknames, and um, I, I, mine has never stopped. Mine has never quit. So <laughs> mine stuck. <laughs> well, I, I think after hearing that, uh, people are going to call you Ross the Boss Stein now. Yeah, well, it's Friedman. So, <laughs> but fair enough. And um, the final question I actually wanted to ask you is: is um is coming from New York, you know, being born and raised here, you've seen so much and being in the scene for so long from, you know, the hardcore movement to, you know, the blues and everything like that. So well, it, started, it first started in 75, the first record. And then by 77, we, we, we were playing CBGBs all the time, that whole movement there. And that's what was, that's what really propelled the dictators. Yeah, so like, what is your take on the New York City scene now, if you if you don't mind me asking? Because like, I thought even before this whole pandemic happened, it was great, dedicated musicians, cool venues. But you know, I keep getting mixed opinions about it. So I was just curious to what your take on the New York City scene is. The scene right now is non-existent, of course, because no one's playing. So um, I, you know, when we were all hanging out, at, you know, the, at the Dumps and all those other places, but you know, it was it was actually people. You know there were places to play Blackthorn, all these, all these venues, these cool venues. So you know, but now, uh, uh, no one is. There's nothing right now. It's everything's on pause. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, 
hopefully sooner than later we're going to get back to it. And uh, I don't know. You know, so I was just talking about that with my friend. It was just, oh, man. It's just, who thought, I mean, like last year, everyone thought in the spring, everyone thought, oh, it's going to be two weeks. Ah, this is going to be two weeks. Everyone's going to be, everyone's going to be back. Two weeks, right? Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, we see where that is. So. Yeah, I had a friend post on Facebook like, "Please give us back shows. I promise, I'll never ask the band what time their set is. I'll stay for the locals. I, I won't leave after my favorite band plays my favorite song." Like everybody's like, re uh, like going to confession of all the stupid shit they've done at shows just to make, if hoping in vain, it'll come back. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people have taken us for granted. <laughs> Definitely. So. So that's one of our things with the Death Dealer record. Our first three songs, uh, we're only we're not sending the whole record to Spotify to them to steal. So we're we're just going to um, we're only three songs on on uh, Concord Lands is going to digital media. The rest, you gotta buy it. You gotta buy the physical copy. Awesome. That's the only way. That's the only way you're going to help Death Dealer. So that's what I say because we ha and also we have so many great. Uh, uh, products uh so many packages uh, um what what it includes and sean, sean peck has gone way over, way beyond way beyond and in, in making making the death dealer brand and and the stuff very very cool and we have uh, great merchandising the artwork is fantastic so i recommend everybody all the metalheads so far the the, the pre-order sales have been fantastic i mean sean was telling me the other day and i'm like wow that is amazing. That's an amazing reaction. So we're we're pushing the record, and uh, the only the best way that the best way we can we can be helped. Any band can be helped is by the physical physical product. Yeah, and could Concord Lands is it, the band? Is it going to be on both CD and vinyl as well? Yes. Awesome. Would we'll definitely pick up a copy. But thank you so much, Ross. Really great to talk to you. Everybody, Ross the Boss, Death Dealer, Conquer Lance. Be sure to buy it. Support your artists. Support all the venues. We will see you next time on Heavy New York. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's all going to open up and we'll all be back together again. But in the meantime, guys, buy the physical copies of the, of the band's music and that's really going to help. Definitely. You heard it here. We'll see you next time, everybody.